Welcome to the What's Your Weird Story podcast. Everyone has at least one good story. And some of us have stories that are just to the left of normal. We're interested in the ones that push the boundaries of what we can perceive. Stories that defy explanations. Stories with an air of mystery. Stories we might not share. For fear of being thought of differently. But don't worry. We're all friends here. So, what's What's your your weird story? story? <laughs> I think everybody's ready to rock, man, these days. I hope so. I hope so, man. Everybody's been uh you know, pinned up for long enough. We need uh we got all sorts of energy to do stuff or something, I guess. I don't know. But hey <laughs> Welcome to the What's Your Weird Story podcast. It is me, Adam BB, and I am here with as always with uh my homie uh, and my my not my sidekick, but my parallel my co-host, my uh, my oldest friend in the world, Barry Johnston. Hello, Barry. What's up, man? How are you? I, I am. I'm doing all right, man. How are you? Good, doing good. We uh, talked a little bit before this, but man, it's hot. God dang, it's hot it? and it's dry, and so we we need some rain, man. We're in a drought, so we need it. It's been very comfortable here. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Asshole. Sorry. Yeah. I can't no. Hear you. No, I would. Nice I wish it was. Yeah, I, but you know, it's Oklahoma. What are you going to do? It just gets exactly. hot as balls. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's you know, it's June in Oklahoma. It's summertime, basically. Yeah. You know, but hey, you know, just think of it this way: um, it really, you really haven't gotten to the heat yet. You it's know, true. you still got yeah. August coming. So that's true. You got something to look forward to. Yeah, man. Golly, I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> Speaking of looking forward, man. So I, so I checked out. This documentary, man, on uh, Hulu, it just popped up into my feed, and it was called Red Dog, right? Yeah. And I was like, now, wait a minute. Now, are we talking about the Red Dog? The world-famous, infamous Red Dog uh, that we all know and love from Oklahoma City. It's a a strip joint that's been around for a long time. And (laughs) by God, it was, man. They made a freaking documentary about it. Really? Yeah, yeah, and uh, that is crazy. It is crazy, and it was. It's actually pretty good, man. It was done through. Um, it was told through the eyes of of one of the kids uh, that grew up. Kind of, you know, his mother was a dancer and is now mm-hmm. retired, but uh, she grew up dancing there in the seventies, and wow. uh, and it's told through. He's now a successful songwriter. Uh, singer songwriter from uh from i think he i think a lot of his stuff is done in nashville mm-hmm. but he did the score for it and everything um it's really good though it's really good man i mean I, I wasn't expecting much and you know when i when i when i started watching it i was like oh wow this is pretty good man it's funny when i'm watching this man like i'm taken back to my childhood of what it was like you know 70s 80s in Oklahoma at that time, right. Oklahoma City was such a small town, man. You know, yeah. oh yeah. I mean, of course, oh, yeah. we always thought it was big, you know, but you know, it was it was a a young and upcoming, not even an upcoming city at that time. It was just sort of in its infantile state, mm-hmm. and um, and it kind of it did a good job of putting you kind of back into that time frame. And so, anyway, it you know. Obviously, it's not something you want to watch around the kids, but it's right, right, pretty entertaining um, if you if you're into that kind of thing. So I just want to throw that out there. Now, Barry, had you ever been to the Red Dog? I have, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been there a couple of times. A couple, actually, yeah. uh, funny enough, man. Um, a couple of years ago, I had a buddy that got married, and 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 it ended. The bachelor party ended at the Red Dog. <laughs> <laughs> and what what I mean by that is, it really got started at the Red Dog, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but me being an old guy, I ended it uh, when they closed down the bar. You know, I went home after that, but uh, but everyone else kind of went on. But but it's funny because it's just, it's an Oklahoma institution. It really is. It really is. It really is. I remember I went there one time, ended up there one time, years and years and years ago, 
um, I want to say this. I want to say it was around uh, Y two K, but I ended up there with with uh, with with uh, Mr. Hubbard mm-hmm. and uh, our buddy Sam, who's uh-huh. been on here a couple of times, yep. and uh, and our friend uh, Eric, who was a guy that we went to college with, and I I I know we were there. Um, I don't remember a lot about it, but I do remember the one thing I do remember: the main attraction uh, that brought us there um was it was coin beer night oh. so you could literally give them any Damn. coin and wow. you would get you know wow. a bottle of beer but like i mean it was all domestic you know like right you know cheap beer anyway but yeah. like you could give them you could give them a nickel you get a beer you give them a penny you get a beer a quarter a beer it's all this you know sure. just anything and like that that was a big well-known thing that they did i uh, probably like once a week or once right. a month but sure. that's what i really remembered about right. it and of course everybody always again when you're you know growing up there it the red dog was very infamous it's a rite and, of uh, passage really yeah it kind of is you it know kind of is you know yeah when you get old enough to to go to to you know clubs like that it's one of the places where you i don't you just kind of go i don't know it but it it was cool. It was a good movie, and you know, and, and people that are interested in that kind of thing, you know, check it out. The really the movie's about kind of the, the the you know the guy that tells the story about it. It's kind of about him sort of like being successful in the you know in the face of like a lot of negativity, you know, right. and his life could have gone a way different way. But uh, but it, it's really really quite a good movie. So well, that's cool. I'll just check that out. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, Weird transition over to uh, what we're going to talk about today, <laughs> but we've got uh, we've got with us today uh, a gentleman who is a fascinating guy. He's a, he's an actor, he's a musician, and he's a door bum. Yeah, and he's a door bum, and he's going to tell the story about him getting that name, and uh, it's really great stuff, and it's a funny, funny story, also. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's uh, and it's one of those weird things where uh, once again, uh, this is another person that our buddy Emotron steered our way, but it's also somebody who, in another lifetime, for myself, uh, our cro- our paths crossed whenever um, we played at this uh, particular venue that he talks about cool. uh, when I was in a band and we played there. So I met, so I cool. guess I met him, you know, back in the day. And that's funny. So yeah, but uh, we'll, we'll let Andy get into it. So joining us today is from Charlotte, North Carolina is, uh, well, actually, I guess he's, that's where he's originally from. He's calling us from uh, sunny California is Andy, the door bomb. Andy, what's your weird story? Uh, so just to give a little context and backstory to set the scene for my story, um, I was living in North Carolina at the time and some good friends of mine in Los Angeles had, uh, developed this idea for a short film that was like a psychedelic post-apocalyptic kind of, uh, film with a bit of a abstract existential slant to it. And, I agreed to come to Los Angeles uh, to play a character in this film and to design my costumes kind of based on my performance character that I do when I perform live. Um, And so I flew out to California and then uh, made my way out to uh, the outskirts of Slab City, uh, which is in the kind of in uh, squatted ex-military base in the Mojave Desert. Um, That's kind of a free for all, you know, there's no laws, there's no police, it's kind of a strange environment. Um, we all pulled our resources and we, uh, built a little village for this set for this film. Uh, you know, we burned it down in the middle of the night with no permits, uh, pretty much no money involved. We, we were, you know, we filmed this little short film and then submitted it to music festivals. Um, somewhere throughout the course of this, uh, I was, told about the plan for my character, which was a hermit, um, that there was a cave that they had found about two hours away, really deep into the desert, um, you know, over an hour from the nearest town. And they were telling me, you know, that, um, 
uh, that that's where we were going to film my scenes. And uh, I kind of got this idea that they should take me there the night before and drop me off and just let me stay there. Um, and I could kind of, you know, get the set ready, you know, like uh, use some charcoal and draw on the walls and cake myself in mud and kind of become this hermit character. And then when they would come in the morning, they would, uh, you know, I would be ready and everything would be good to go. And I'd be kind of in character, you know, because I spent the night there by myself anyway. Um, somewhere throughout the course of my departure, someone handed me some hits of LSD and I took them with me and I thought, yeah, this could be nice. Um, so, you know, I got to this cave, they left, I had no cell phone service. I didn't know where I was on a map. Um, and they left and said, we'll see you in the morning. And I said, okay, sounds good. Um, so I proceeded to, uh, you know, decorate the cave cause this was in the daytime. Um, I caked myself in mud, uh, you know, like wetted a bunch of clay from the, the little canyon that the cave was in and just caked my beard and my hair and everything in mud and was wearing rags essentially. And, um, you know, and I got everything ready. And so, you know, night was coming and I decided that it might be a good idea to take the acid. That they gave me. <laughs> uh, oh boy. <laughs> <sighs> you know, in the, beginning of a already <laughs> yeah you set yourself up caked in, mud, caked in mud out in the caked. desert by yourself ready to drop yeah. some acid yeah, Getting no, ready to transform into a psychedelic <laughs> caveman i think yeah, yeah in an no. epic voyage or so <laughs> yeah you know no cell service but in my mind you know I, I do a lot of hiking and camping alone anyway so i feel really comfortable in those settings and in my mind i'm so far away from so many other people and i'm going to be stationary my thought is what could possibly go wrong you know this yeah. is perfect it's of like course. the i'm just sheltered in a little bubble everything's going to be great you right. know and so it was great at first um you know the sun went down and i had a little fire going and uh you know, I was kind of laying there and watching the fire on flicker off the walls. And, you know, of course, it started to get a pretty intense and I and I was loving it. You know, it was great. And um, and then I started to hear this sound. Uh, it's kind of like a low rumble in the distance. And I thought, what is that sound? And then I thought, well, you know, it's probably just some auditory something going on, like the fire roaring and echoing off the Canyon wall or something, you know? Um, so I just kind of laid back and continued to enjoy my little internal journey that I was on. And, uh, the sound got louder and louder and eventually it got to a point where I was pretty sure that it, it was real you know that it was a that it was a legitimate sound not a auditory hallucination of some sort and so i kind of went to the mouth of the canyon and or of the cave which you know opens up and really loud at this point i started to think it sounds like a helicopter and and th I was thinking, you know, like there's probably a military base somewhere around you know, here. Um, Cause at least by slab city, there are, there is still an active like bombing range out there for the, for the air force, I think. Um, and so when you're in slab city, you know, you can, you hear bombs in the distance and see little mushroom clouds of dust. Uh, it's kind of really fitting for the post-apocalyptic vibe <laughs> that the film was going for, you know? Um, but, you know, I was a couple hours away from there, so I was thinking, well, maybe they're just doing a routine little flight or something. And, um, so I went back into the cave, and I, I, I thought, well, let me bury all of my stuff. I don't know why I thought it would be a good idea, but I just took all of my actual belongings, and I buried them in sand and in the cave. And so all I had were just like these remnants from the film, like all these, you know, like things that looked like I was living in a cave, you know, and... uh and then I the and then the noise got really really loud, you know, just like sounded like it was right on top of me. And I I went out again to the entrance to the cave, and I was looking down the the canyon a bit, 
and I saw this, what I thought was like a light of some sort. Uh, okay, like maybe I'm not really seeing this. It was really vague, in the, you know, down in the canyon a bit. And um, so, so, you know, I, I kept going back and forth. And at this point, I was starting to freak out a little bit, you know, because... You know, of course, like your internal brain, there's a lot of rationalization that you can do, but maybe not so much under the influence of a psychedelic substance by yourself in the yeah, no kidding, <laughs> in a cave in the desert. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've had a moment like so, that, so I'm laughing with you, not at you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So okay. Um, so, so uh, you know, I went back in the cave and kind of thought to myself, like, it's just going to go away. You know, every, everything's just going to go away. Like, I'm, I'm just freaking out a little bit. You know, a rational brain started to say, like, that. you know, you're probably overreacting. This isn't quite as weird as it seems like it is. You did eat, eat acid. You are by yourself in electronic light in the desert, you know, just a fire. And, uh, and then, you know, I, and then I saw on the cave wall a flicker of some other kind of light. And I thought, okay, this is real. And I went back to the mouth of the cave and looked down the Canyon, the little slot Canyon that it was at the end of. And there was just like a UFO beam of light shining from the sky into the Canyon. And it was just maneuvering, swaying back and forth, coming up the Canyon toward me. Whoa. Whoa. And at this point I was just like, okay, <laughs> this is, uh, <laughs> this is getting way too real. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah. uh, so the, the beam comes and the, the noise is quite loud and it, it comes up the, it's right on top of me and it is a helicopter and it's shining its spotlight directly on me. Oh, um, shit. and it's just, at the top of the can, just a barely above the the top of the canyon, uh, shining and just hovering, looking at me, uh, oh. shining a giant, very bright spotlight at me. It is a helicopter, um, and it's just shining this light directly on to me, a very bright spotlight, hovering just above the top of the canyon, um, and it's just sitting there, you know, and it's uh, looking right at me with uh, this giant light. And I didn't know what to do. I thought about running, uh, but, I, you know, then I realized really quickly there's nowhere that I could go. You know, I can't right. just, I, yeah. I could just run back in the cave, I guess. But what, what, you know, I don't know what that would solve. So I just held my hand up uh, kind of like a wave, but I didn't wave it around. I just held it up, you know, to signal to them that I saw them and right. that. Uh, I was there, you know, like, hi, I'm a human being. <laughs> right. <laughs> just, just, everything's real, real weird right now. Meanwhile, I'm me sure your eyes were also probably the size of plates as well. Oh. Like, oh. <laughs> Man. Yeah. And, you know, at this point, it crosses my mind that I'm caked in mud and dressed in rags, you know. Right. I'm, uh, I'm fully in character, you know, and these, but these people have no idea. Uh, I don't know who these people are even. I didn't. I couldn't see the helicopter. I could just see a light, but based on the sound and everything, I knew it was a helicopter of some sort. Right. Uh, and they just sit there for, uh, you know, I mean, of course, like, it's hard to say because time gets a little weird when you're, you know, under the influence of a psychedelic, but uh, uh, they sit there for a long, long time just hovering. They don't say anything. You know, I'm waiting for them to, like, say something i'm thinking like am i trespassing am right. i you know what am, i don't know what i'm doing wrong i don't know where i am you know and um I, I but i notice after a little bit that the canyon is filled with smoke from my fire you know it's been like coming out of the cave and just like laying in a haze uh and that's kind of swirling around with the light and they sit there for what i would guess to be 20 minutes um and that's a long time, by the way. Twenty minutes. So, you know yeah. what I mean? For Damn. a helicopter to be Holy hovering shit, there. Man. Oh, that's, gotta, you. that's gotta be freaky, dude. It, it was you're, you're you know tripping, it, tripping balls like crazy. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it would have been weird had I not been tripping, you know. Right, <laughs> right. yeah, for sure. Yeah. But uh 
Yeah, and you know, there was no one else to consult about like what should we do, you know, like what's going on, what do we think this is? It's just me and acid brain, you know, uh just thinking like, oh God, like this is terrible. This is the worst thing that could have <laughs> happened to me right now. Um so eventually it it does leave and I don't know what to do at that point. I think my first thought is someone's coming, you know, like someone's definitely coming. Right. Um, probably to arrest me. Uh, I don't know, you know, maybe I'm on somewhere, I'm somewhere I shouldn't be, or I'm not supposed to have a fire or I don't know. And yeah. all I can think is I need to call someone or get in touch with someone somehow, but there is no cell service. So I go back in the cave and I make sure my stuff is really well buried for whatever reason, I don't know. I didn't want them to like find some trace of me, <laughs> <laughs> even though I left all the stuff from the, like for the set there, you know? So it just looked like some guy had been living in this cave. Right. Um, and then I get the idea that maybe if I climb the Canyon wall, <laughs> I can get cell phone service. Somehow. Oh, Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm imagining what the guys in the helicopter are thinking. Like, what the fuck is that? Is that I? That's a I imagine there's some great <laughs> cell phone video somewhere that, that, that all, all the all the people back at the station got shown. You know, of this uh, guy living in the desert. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. So I I decide to climb the canyon wall. I decided this is the thing I should do. Um, because I knew when we came in, you know, I had to hike up the canyon to get to the cave. And I knew that down there, there was a road, but no one was on that road. Uh, you know, when we were there in the daytime, we didn't see a single other car. So I knew there was no one was going to be down there. That would be the way that someone would come from if they were coming to find me. And that there was no cell phone service there. I, I had not had cell phone service since I'd been back in town, which was over an hour away by car. So I decided to climb the canyon, um, which was a terrible idea because it's all this like crusty mud shale that just crumbles, you know, when you, yeah. when you try to do anything with it. Uh, and it's at night. And, and it's a, you're on, you're on, how many hits of acid was it? I guess uh, it doesn't matter how many hits. It at was this a few. Point. <laughs> right, right. And, it was, and i'll say it was pretty good it was, it was pretty strong fuck yeah it was man they were coming to look for you that's how good it was <laughs> yeah 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 it, it called in the helicopter yeah. so it, it must have been pretty good oh. yeah no you know i'll say that was another thing that i noticed before i get to the climbing the canyon that it, it felt very much like and, and if you've ever had a psychedelic experience that's intense enough, you probably know that feeling where it feels like suddenly the entire universe is like focused directly on you. Yeah. Right. And it's just like this gaze or this like giant finger just like pinpointing you out of everything. Yeah. To, you know, either like transmit some kind of information to or just to just suddenly that you are like seen in the universe somehow. It's a weird sensation. Uh, and the spotlight definitely magnified that sensation that like yeah. somehow I had just attracted this to me, you know, out here in the, in the middle of nowhere. I had just called called the gaze upon me you know? <laughs> so, uh, and it was pretty terrifying you know and it, didn't, it didn't didn't feel very good <laughs> at the time um so yeah i just i decided to climb the wall and it takes me uh it wasn't a very deep canyon but i would guess that it took me over an hour to climb up and i didn't make it all the way to the top but i made it to this little ledge uh where i could kind of sit down and look at my phone and at the time it wasn't even a smartphone it was like a flip phone and this was only a couple couple years ago but i was a little behind on the times and um i see that i have one bar of service and i call my friend who's making the film and he immediately when he answers the phone he doesn't say hello or anything he just says what's wrong because he knows that oh. I shouldn't have cell phone service, you know that right. I that there's no way that I 
that there was any service anywhere near where I was. So he knew if I was calling, something was probably wrong. And I just started to fumble through this, you know, okay, man, I, I know it sounds crazy, but I, I, you know, I took that acid and he was like, wait, what, what acid? And I was like, well, I got some acid before <laughs> I left. And I took, I took the acid and, that's, and a helicopter came and he was like, are you sure it was a helicopter? And I was like, it's definitely a helicopter. <laughs> and, it, and it definitely saw me and it definitely sat there for a really long time. And, uh, they know I'm here. I'm sure they're coming. So if you get here in the morning and I'm not here, come find me. I'm sure I'll be in jail. You know, I, I'm sure I'm sure something terrible is is going yeah, to yeah. happen. Yeah, and I just want someone to know. <laughs> uh, and then about that time, the call drops, and uh, there's no more cell phone service. I don't know how I got. Uh, you know, I scrambled around a little bit more and trying to find the bar of service again, but it it disappeared and never came back. So, uh, you know, I, I sit there for a while and try to think like, what should I do at this point? Uh, it's cold. You know, the desert gets pretty cold at night. This was in February, you know, so it, get, it can get very cold and I'm dressed in rags, you know? Um, and so it's getting very cold and I think I, maybe I should climb back down to the fire and I try a little bit and realize that I'm, I'm going to fall, that it's like, that I can't crawl back down. Ugh. Cause you have no source of light, but the stars, right. And like maybe the, the you know, the, the flip phone screen, it didn't wow. even have a flashlight on it. Oh, you know? man, so it was just man. like a vague Damn. blue glow <laughs> of death. <laughs> that is so dangerous. Yeah. So I decide to stay on the ledge. Um, so, yeah, so I just sat there all night until like nine o'clock in the morning, you know, and I I, uh, I kept thinking I would hear something. I'd fall asleep a little bit here and there after, you know, things started to wear off a little bit in my mind. And but still every, you know, bird or a rabbit or any kind of noise, I'd wake up and think like, oh, God, they're coming here. They come, you know, like <laughs> I just got to like stay here. Yeah. St think small, you know, like yeah. think, think invisible. Yeah. <laughs> don't, 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 uh, <laughs> don't let them find you, you know, yeah. like let them find your stuff. Don't let them find you. Um, and, but you know, somehow no one comes, uh, until about 10 o'clock the next morning. And this was probably 10 at night when all this happened. So, you know, for a solid, 12 hours i was just on this ledge uh freezing my ass off you know and and tripping for a vast majority of that time yeah God. um and eventually the crew like my friends you know uh the little ragtag crew of, to film i hear well i hear some yelling coming up from the canyon saying andy and i was still in like a little bit of a haze and my first instinct was don't answer. <laughs> like, who, who knows who this is? You yeah. know, like, do they need, <laughs> I, I don't know. Somehow in my mind, I thought they know who I am and they've, they're coming to find me. And that doesn't mean that it's my friends. It right. might be somebody else. Um, and they, uh, eventually they come up, it's daytime now and I'm sober. I can see well enough to climb down. So I do. And I make it. And they, you know, come up to me and uh, say, oh, we're so glad, you know, you're here uh, and everything's OK. And essentially they were just like, are you ready to film? <laughs> like, oh, shit. <laughs> and, you know, since my character was a, a hermit who was supposed to have gone for years without seeing anyone, I was real ready to be that character. You know, yeah. um, it, I was there. I, I was I'd spend a night of really hoping that I would not see another person being terrified of the idea that a person would come. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, I, you know, I had never acted before. And so I think that it, uh, I think that it went pretty well when it, when all things are considered, you know, that it, uh, uh it was a terrifying experience, but it <laughs> was uh, probably exactly what it needed to be. Yeah. For the thing, for the thing yeah. that it was, you know? right? Um, you were taking method acting to the next level. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, unintentionally. <laughs> right. Uh, it was not my intention to do that exactly, but. Um, Say, Barry. Yeah. What's the weirdest job you've ever had? Yeah. 
That's a good question. It would either have to be the time that I worked at a cattle feedlot or the time that I worked for a Greek painter. Were you his model? Uh, not quite. You know, it's funny because one of my weirdest jobs was being in a model in art school. But it was portraits, not full body nude. The reason I'm asking is because those jobs may be kind of normal, but we know people are out there that have weirder jobs than that. Maybe you're a mortician. Maybe you're a scientist trying to bring back the dinosaurs or the woolly mammoth. That'd be cool. That would be really cool. If you guys out there have weird jobs, unusual jobs, crime scene photographer, maybe you worked at an adult educational film set. If you know what I mean, wink, wink. Just something that's unusual, out of the ordinary, and, you know, a little bit weird. Hey, those are cool stories, too. We'd love to hear those. So give us a call or an email or whatever. You know how to get a hold of us. Be part of the community of Weirdsville. But, yeah, you know, it's an experience that I think about a lot, um... And I, you know, still occasionally will, I mean, it's been a little while now, but uh, I do still dabble in those things every once in a while when I want to reset or something, you know, and uh, yeah. I take it very seriously and I don't think, don't treat it like a party or anything because I know based on experiences like that, how, uh, you know, if you go looking for something in your mind, you might... Uh, you might not be anticipating exactly what you're going to yeah, find. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it has. A, it definitely has a way of humbling you and 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 putting things in perspective. And um, and sometimes, like you said, like the things that you conjure up in your mind present themselves to you in that state, and it's weird. You can't really, you know, like you said, you thought you might have called it. Well. Anybody that's ever had a experience like that knows that it is odd that some of the things that you think about and they kind of come to fruition through that experience is just it's just bizarre. So the fact that there's you know this unidentified helicopter looking for you while you are the only person out in this vast place is just too bizarre to be coincidental in a way you know mm. not not to say yeah, it's more than that but you know it's if if if, if, if no if if you've never done that if you've never had that experience then you can't explain it to somebody like that but i mean facts are facts there's a reason why people do choose to have those experiences and there's a reason why some people can't handle them and choose not to have that anymore you know because it is powerful man it's it's you can't escape it it's when it's on you it's on you oh yeah and you have to deal with it you know and that's you know i i think that i think that's depending on your personality it's good for people to explore you know the mind a bit you know, and that and that's one way to do it. And uh, absolutely. But what was the name of the? Can you say the name of the movie? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's called Bring Water. Okay. Yeah, and it's uh, it's up on YouTube. You know, you can okay. uh, cool. you can you can watch it um, and see. You can see the yeah, if you if you just type in Bring Water film, uh, it'll it'll come right up. And it, you you know, it's short. It's maybe fifteen minutes long. And, okay. Um, yeah, but you can get a sense of the. Um, it's one of the reasons that I chose to tell the story because you can actually get a sense for where it was and uh, kind of the scenery and how I looked, you know. Right. Um, and uh, you know, it, it gives a little extra context to kind sure. of imagine these things what happening. You, and what do you think a chopper was doing out there? Do you have any idea? I have a guess. Um, that's the other thing that's weird about it, though. You know, there's no resolution right. to it. There's no, like, right. I have no idea what it was and, like, what... The, because the odds of a... Like you said, the odds of a helicopter finding me in the middle of the desert, it's like a needle in a haystack, you know? Like, there's... Yeah. It's... If you've ever been to the Mojave, it's it's vast and yeah. desolate, you know? And, uh, and I was far, far away from any people, you know? That, so I don't think that anyone would have called... Um, the only thing that I can figure 
is that, you know, the, the Slab City in that area, I was a little north of Slab City, but um, it's near the Salton Sea, which is only yeah. a few hours from the border with Mexico. Okay. And my only thought would be that maybe there was some kind of immigration patrol that saw the smoke okay. from the fire. Okay. And either thought that it was a wildfire or that it was someone camped out. Gotcha. That might have been coming from across the border. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I was going to say that the most logical down to earth kind of scenario would be that it was somebody saw the smoke and was investigating the fire. Um, but, you know, who knows? It could have been, it could have been a black ops helicopter, you know, black helicopter or something. Could have been something in the military. Could have been somebody. Just a recreational fel- uh, helicopter flying around and just spotting you, and you know who knows, starting to figure out could have been a UFO. I yeah, never you know. know. I never. I will say, I never actually saw the helicopter. You know, I yeah. only saw the light and yeah. I heard the sound. And the sound, you know, I, I definitely do know the difference. I think between like a basic helicopter and like a military. You know, like the mm. it's a lot more thunderous. The military helicopter. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't say for certain because, you know, I'm sure my auditory senses were a bit affected at the time. Yeah. Uh, it definitely did not sound like a little private helicopter. It sounded like a like a, a big one, you know, right. like a, yeah. Yeah. Uh, something pretty substantial. Like I've, I've seen like the Blackhawks and stuff fly over and heard them. And it reminded me a lot more of something like that. Right. Um, so maybe, I mean, it probably, I imagine it was something pretty official. Um but that they probably, you know, like what whatever it was that they were investigating, they probably realized that I wasn't the thing that they were looking for. <laughs> I would have loved to see in my mind. I haven't seen the, the the images from the the video yet. So in my mind, I'm thinking of like you looking very similar to uh, Tom Hanks in uh, the later part of Castaway, you know, and so just like you know, hair crazy and beard and just dirty and everything and somebody you know somebody in a helicopter above shining a light on you the conversation going on there (laughs) amongst each other as they're just hovering for 20 minutes yeah probably two but you were on you know the acid so it could you know it seemed like (laughs) you know it was there for 20 30 hours um but uh, you know it's like just the conversation was like what the fuck is this guy yeah. all about? Yeah. I can imagine. It, but, if uh, I imagine their conversation, I imagine it being something like, oh, it's a crazy guy living in the desert. Yeah. Right. <laughs> let's just sit here for a while and freak yeah, him out. Yeah, let's freak him out. <laughs> <laughs> He's clearly on acid. <laughs> oh that's great yeah, man if only they knew i wish i could meet whoever those people were and you know hear it from both sides uh that's hilarious man that's but yeah a- you know it's still to this day though I, like you you were saying barry with the um I, with the uh you know calling stuff to yourself and those kinds of experiences um i still feel that in some way you know like i, I know um that's not probably literally what happened, but uh, but it does not. It never fails to surprise me in my because I am the type of person that likes to explore those parts of my mind yeah. uh, a bit cautiously, you know, because I know that it's serious. It can be serious business. Right. Um, uh, but you know, I've ha- I've had experiences where it just seemed a little too coincidental that how what are the odds that at this time this thing happens? Right. Um, and not, you know, small things that you make into big things, but like things like helicopters coming and spotlighting yeah. you in the middle of the desert, you know. And, and, uh, yeah. And the fact that you're playing this character who's supposed to be this sort of deranged character that hasn't seen people or whatever and, in a long time. And now you're actually forced to put yourself in a very uncomfortable position the entire night which turns into being filmed the next day. It's like, you know, it's like it kind of was the perfect storm or whatever, you know? Oh, like, I'm gr- yeah, I'm grateful for it, honestly. Yeah. yeah. With the we, Because of the end result, you know, like I uh, I wouldn't change a thing, you yeah. know? I'm glad, glad that it happened that way. And I'm glad that it was documented in some way, you know? Like, yeah. at least like the next day, you know, like, of course, there's no mention of that in the film or anything, but just that there is this thing that I can look back on and remember 
the circumstances around it and how intense it all was, you know? Sure, sure. Um, you know, and the, and the whole thing was kind of intense because we had gone out into the desert just as friends and everyone scrounged materials from Los Angeles, you know, and we just all pulled our resources. It was a bunch of friends who were artists and we had no money and we just built a village in the desert and then we burned it in the middle of the night to film this scene. And then, you know, I went off to the cave and then that whole thing happened. And, uh, you know, it was just such a surreal weekend. I, I, yeah. I'm glad, you know, that there's a little film to look back on that is also, you know, a pretty surreal kind of uh, film in and of itself, like the world that it's supposed to exist in, you know. And uh, so it's it's just strange, the parallels between like the actual experience and the what the film was supposed to be about and what it was, you know, Uh, I'm thankful for it. You know, I I wouldn't I wouldn't change it. I don't know if I go back and do it again. Well, yeah, I'd probably go back. And do it again. <laughs> <laughs> this time, I want to come and film it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what you need. That would be man. fun. It, it, I don't know fun. if it'd be the same. That'd be like oh, that's that, true. Sl- that that double dual slot experiment, yeah, or whatever. You that's know, like right. when you when you watch the atoms, they behave differently. That's you true. Know, than, yeah, than yeah, you, exactly. That's know. yep, yep, absolutely, man. Well, that's awesome, it's, dude. And either way, I mean, even if you were somebody was there to document it, or even if you documented it yourself, you're on, you're only going to get what is the video perception. You're not yeah. going to get your perception, right. you know? Yeah, what's going on there. So right, it might yeah, it might have been a boring video. It'd just be like a spot, a really bright light. Somebody being like, "What the fuck are we going to do? What the fuck yeah, are we right. going to do?" <laughs> you know, like, yeah. right. Right. I think it I think it exists a little better in a in a story, you know, like No, yeah. absolutely. Uh, yeah. For sure, man. And yeah. and I mean again, and nobody's could that that whole experience could not be transcribed in any way better than with how you tell it. So that yeah. because you experienced it. So Great like, except for maybe with the helicopter pilots would be a, a better Yeah, actually, yeah, okay, <laughs> right. that's true. We could talk to the yeah. helicopter. If they were if there were helicopter pilots there, yeah, you know, who knows? It was something, you know. Right. Like I said, I did I, I all I saw was a beam of light. I did not right. see a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what it was, but yeah. you know, who know, who knows. <laughs> that's awesome, man. What a great story, man. Dude, yeah, for real. And you're lucky that, you know, night climbing is something that they tell you not to do. And uh, you, yeah, you're definitely fortunate, man. Very lucky not yeah. to have had. Yeah, I'm not a, happened. I'm not a climber at all, and the that was definitely not a, a rock face that you should climb. And I was definitely not in the right mental state, or had any of the right equipment, like light, you know. So it was, uh, it could have ended really badly in a lot of yeah. different ways, you know. Sure. Um, I wouldn't recommend that anyone at home listening tries this on purpose, but you know. Yeah, yeah. If you if you find yourself in the situation, you know, just do the best with what you yeah, got. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's all you can do, man. <laughs> yeah. Maybe maybe save the acid for later. Uh, yeah, maybe. maybe. <laughs> do do some deep digging inside of yourself and make sure you're ready for it. Right. <laughs> if you if you're uh, <laughs> if you're gonna go there under such uh, circumstances, they might seem ideal when you go into it. But uh, let me tell you. It, Something th- things can go wrong, <laughs> yeah, right? Right, right. <laughs> and but uh, things can also turn out just fine in the end. Sure. Uh, which luckily for me they did. So That's great, perfect. I'm man. happy for that. Awesome. Great story, dude. Great story. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Feel lucky to have lived it. <laughs> That's great. I always love those types of stories, man. If you don't overdo it, I, I've known a lot of people that overdo it, man. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. I've gotten better about that over the years, you know, uh, when I was younger, I was definitely a lot more careless, but you know, that taught me to have a healthy respect yeah. for these things that they're not, uh, for me, at least like, it's not a party. It's like no. a deep dive into definitely. some internal things that you will probably not be able to explore otherwise, yeah. you know, and definitely. it's, uh, and it can be, it can be scary. Yeah. Uh, I've definitely had some nightmare scenarios, but I, but I still feel like I've come back from them having learned a lot about myself right. and about the world just because suddenly you can you know what it's like to see it through a different lens yeah. like a yeah. very different lens you know you know it's yeah. it I've never done DMT but people I listen to stories that people t- tell about with DMT um you know of course Tron told his stories and stuff and yeah it, it's kind of like that where like you you all this you suddenly realize you're a part of something much greater than yourself and 
sort of coming to grips with that and understanding a little bit more your place in the world, you know, I think it'd be beneficial for a lot of people to do yeah. that kind of uh, research on themselves. Because I think there's a lot of people out there, as advanced as we are, there's a lot of people out there that just, they don't give any credence to that and they don't think it's real, you know? Yeah. And, and, uh, but yeah, the, but the, the thing is, reality is perception, you know? Like right. Our, Yes. Our reality is vastly different from what an animal perceives or what another person perceives yes. or even a, a plant, you know, like they probably perceive things in a way that we don't even understand how they do yet, you know, right. and it, to think that, uh, I mean, in my opinion, you know, like uh, dreams are also real, you know, not yep. not in this, not in the sense that like. You know, if I dream that, uh, you know, you know, I did, I broke something when I wake up, the thing's not going to be broken. But for for my brain, which is what feeds my reality because it's what perceives it. Right. That happened. I experienced right. it. Right. You know, I experienced the thing happening and therefore it is just as real as any other experience. hundred percent, man. That's why people do, you know, that's where there's, there's people that are really in intense with uh, like uh, meditation and yoga practice and things like that, because they claim that they can get to those states by doing these things, man. Yeah. And I, there's yeah. just, a, there's a huge benefit to it. I mean, I don't, I don't see any downside to it. I mean, the downside is as if, you know, un, you know, unfortunately, people that, you know, are schizophrenic and, and you know, it, it can trip those wires in people. Of, right. co of course. I mean, that's that's the, uh, it can. Yeah. You know, and that's and that's unfortunate. But and the occasional bad trip. But I mean, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. shit, that happens. Everybody, that's something uh, yeah. you've got to ex expect. Right. If there's, you go an, into there's, it, an, there's an inherent risk in anything. Right. I mean, walking exactly. out the door, there's an inherent exactly. risk. Yeah, exactly. Um, and if it's so, handled in a like if it's handled respectfully and in with, you know, in a place where it's like, you know, it's, it's like, it's a, cer not a cer ceremonial for lack of better word, but like something that it's, you know, almost like, you know, a medical, you know, procedure, uh, of some sort, you know, uh, a therapy, whatever right. you want to call it. But if it's, if it's handled in a co somewhat controlled environment to where, you know, you're not scrambling up the walls, you know, like not, yeah, set, <laughs> you set, know, set and setting. Yeah. 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 yeah in know. a lot of ways. You know, that, keep, yeah. that would be my advice to people would be to treat it with a healthy respect, you know, yeah. because it's, it is, a, it is serious business. And, you know, going back to my story, I, I thought in my mind that this was a pretty controlled environment because I, I thought I, there's no way I'm going to run into people. There's no yeah. way. Yeah. I'm not moving around, so I'm not going to hurt myself. You know, I'm going to be in this cave. You know, everything's going to be fine. Yep. Um, but, yeah, you know, sometimes things happen that you don't expect, and, and that's part of it. You know, that's part right. of the, the learning experience of something like that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, going back to what you were saying, I, I had an uncle uh, who passed uh, in the last year, but he he was schizophrenic, uh, diagnosed from the time he was 14. And um, I've also thought about that you know, because it does run in my family a little bit. And, you know, so there's always that in the back of my mind too, as far as just trying to right. not overdo things. And sure. But, you know, I always treated him the same way. You know, a lot of people looked at him and just thought, you know, he was crazy or whatever. And, um, I mean, he did have a mental illness, uh, uh you know, and I use the word crazy only because that's what people called him, you know, yeah. but, uh, but, you know, when I talked to him, I, he would, when he was having bad days and he would talk about, you know, like his, uh, the person that he talked to that no one else could hear or see uh, that told him to do things. Um, I always treated him, you know, I just would have a conversation with him about it. Like it was a real thing because I didn't feel like there was any sense in trying to convince him that it wasn't real because like we were saying, you know, like it was real to him. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, to, to try to convince him that it wasn't is just asinine. You know, it's right. it, rid ridiculous to even fathom that like, that was his reality, you know, sure. and he, and he lived with that his entire life. Right. And, um, and, you know, and I think maybe experiences like that taught me a little bit that like, you, that perception is reality, you know, it, yeah, um, right. those right. experiences are real no matter how they come to you. And, um, and if you're open, you can learn from them, you know, and, right. uh, I mean, yeah, but you have to, I think personally, my opinion would be just to, you know, be respectful about them and uh, right. treat them as as though they are learning experiences, not you know, 
not a party or you well, know one, like a w- one thing's for sure is that if you don't go into it with that mentality it will it will bend you into or break you into submission you know yes it, it you can't run from yourself if you're not comfortable with yourself dude like i i i've always been a person that is um I hold a lot of value in what people say and the person that they present to other people. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can get through that facade pretty quickly when you do something like like this stuff. Yeah. You know when you when you trip, you 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 see the the your real person, man, and you can't hide from that person uh, because it's it's there in all of its glory and uh, all its ugliness. And- <laughs> exactly, dude. Yeah. 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 But, you know, I mean, and a lot of people just don't have it in them to do that. And, and, you know, hey, you know, that's 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 totally understandable. Um, But don't don't discount it. Yeah. Don't discount it either, though. You know what I mean? That's my I agree. You know, I agree. I I definitely think that. um, Yeah. In a lot of ways, like artistically and uh, just like things that I've decided to try to do in life, you know, like traveling and like, you know, touring around the world and stuff like I think I lost a lot of the fear of those things from experiences like that because I realized that the only thing that stands between you and the things that you, the world that you would like to exist in is yourself. You know, you're the barrier, you are the gate, you know, that you, that you have to pass through. That's right. Um, and beyond that is a a world of possibility, you know, and, um, and it's, you know, those experiences really are what shaped, my opinion of that and i think probably caused me to try to go for a lot of things in life that when i was younger i would have thought were not worth trying for because the likelihood of them happening were small or Mm -hmm. next to none you know and uh the more i've let go of that idea that you know that you shouldn't try things because it's unlikely that they'll happen the more that those things have actually happened you know like they actually have become possibilities and realities and uh Right. Yeah, I mean, it, that that was crucial for me, you know, like my life would not be the same if it weren't for uh, pushing up against those boundaries a little bit uh, mentally, you know, and yeah. and trying to see what's on the other side of the veil. Right. Um, well, there, so I'm, yeah, there's a reason, grateful for it. There's a reason why uh, most ancient cultures uh, uh, practiced the, mm-hmm. you know, these types of things because it, 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 they, they re- they were able to see themselves in a way it put into perspective life in in a different way in modern yep. society i mean shit we got an air conditioner man we don't got to sit outside and suffer you know yeah. right. <laughs> you know back in the you know back when the egyptians were building pyramids there's a reason why they were driven to do that you know there was a there was there was a they were closer to the foundation of humanity uh, they understood the fragility of life. Mm. Um, they they had a for whatever reason us humans are are we have a drive to live and a drive to create. Yeah. And and there's no better example than the than the pyramids. I mean, just the yeah. the, the the sheer focus and you know determination to get something like that done. Back then, with the technologies that they had, you know, it's 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 really. It's mind blowing, and I think a lot of that has to do with um, these types of. I'm not saying that they did this exactly, but I'm saying that there, there, there's something about that mentality of uh, of knowing that you're a part of something bigger than yourself, and you want to contribute something to life, and you want yes. to have your life to have meaning. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Everybody wants to be. Well, not, obviously not everybody, but for the most part, it's part of human nature to want to belong. And that's why we have, you know, fans, and sports teams and, you know, or people who follow and fanatically, yep. you know, um, you know, television shows or whatever. Yep. You know, it's why we have organizations where people can go and, um, you know, d- d- talk about. You know, hunting or politics or or yep. or you know, art or whatever. You know, people want to belong to stuff and yep. and you you know, feel like it, at least in their mind where they can feel like it. Because yeah, you know, 
I've heard so many, you know, people talking about their favorite sports team and in, in, including themselves in it. It's like, well, we're going to do this. Issue. If we do this, right. this yeah. year or whatever, yep. and it's like, dude, you're not part of that team. You're just, you know, wearing the jersey and you're watching. Tell, them tell a Green Bay get... Packer fan that. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. I know that. I know better than that. I know better than that. Yeah. You know, it's it's it, it but it is, man. It's like because we want it. We want to be. We want to be involved in something greater than ourselves. You yeah. know, and yeah. it's and it's that mentality of 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 wanting to congregate together, wanting to get together, and no matter what it is that you're, what whatever it is, the idol that we're sort of getting around, you know, it it, it can be a multitude of things, but that doesn't take away from the process and what people get out of it, you know. Yeah, the thing though with with you know with the the sort of psychedelic experiences that I find to be really interesting is that, you know. <clears throat> human beings essentially are, you know, we came from hunter gatherer societies and our brains are essentially the same as they were in the, you know, like when we evolved to that point. Um, so we still have hunter gatherer brains and a lot of that feeling of wanting to belong, I think is like a instinctual tribalism that we have. That's like a survival mechanism. Yep. But, but the thing that I love about the, some, the, the psych, that psychedelic feeling of oneness that you get, uh, is that it I think it takes it a step above that because you feel a oneness with everything. Yeah. Right, and right. and it, and that transcends the the kind of feudalism or tribalism yeah. aspect of a bit and takes it to a step above that where it puts everything on a level playing field. Yeah. And it's not just your group that you identify with that you feel like you're a part of. You feel like you're a part of all of the things right. at once, including the inanimate things and the you know like and that that to me is a feeling of belonging that i'm grateful for knowing you know yeah. because i uh that's an important one you know because the the feeling of belonging to some of the other groups can lead to a lot of strife yes. in the world yes uh, yes definitely. definitely you know when sides start to rally against one another and right well so there, i do think it's a valuable experience yeah, to feel yeah feel a kinship with everything yes. yeah and I, and I and i think what you're talking about there with with uh you know because a lot of those things that we 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 sort of um, get ourselves involved in are they're mindless things they're not they're not noble p- pursuits you know what i mean they're not yeah th- it's not a spiritual pursuit to right. to you know to root for a team or whatever but but people become encompassed in it because they lose their footing you know what i mean like if they went out and freaking dropped some acid once in a while and realized <laughs> <laughs> that's not even a speck that that's not a speck in the in the eye of of uh what whatever you believe god to be man I, yeah, and that's one thing that's one thing my dad my dad and i we've had this conversation a few times he's very religious he, you know he's i wouldn't say religious he's very spiritual he's a super conservative guy yeah, but I'm like you know, it when you do something like take a a uh, psychedelic, it really puts everything into perspective. You 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 look into you you look you get a glimpse into maybe what the mind of God might be if that's what you believe in. You know, it's just like a just a glimpse of this is your place. This is the reality. You're no bigger or better than the next thing. You know, every everything, every bird, every ant, every tree, every, you know, you name it, has a place. There's a reason why this thing operates the way that it does, you know. Yeah. And, and that has to go with our psychology as well, man. And when you start doing, you start dabbling in, in um, psychedelics, it changes the way, from that point on, you will be a changed human being. I, I believe yeah. that. Either yeah. whether or not you ever do it again or not, you're you're going to have a different perception of what you, what this reality can in, entail. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It definitely offers a glimpse that you're a part of a bigger, much bigger team. Yes, and that there's actually only one team. Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. And we're we're all on it. Hundred <laughs> yeah. percent, dude. Hundred percent. Man, thank you, Andy, for coming on, dude. You you really. Just fantastic, dude! Fantastic. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks and, for having uh, me. And to tell us about your music, man. Where, where can we find your stuff, and what do you got going on? Uh, if you could just go to andythedoorbum.com, it'll take you to my uh, 
uh, you know, it'll lead you to all, all my stuff, you know, and all my music and, or, you know, just type Andy, the door bum into a search engine. And I'm the only person that you'll Dude, find. You, you got to um, enlighten us on, on the name. Where, yeah. where, what is that it, about? I, it actually came from when I was 20 years old. Uh, I pestered my friend Neil, who had uh, taken over the Milestone Club in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, it's a whole bunk rock venue that's been open since 1969. And um, I pestered him, even though I wasn't old enough to drink, uh, to work the door there. And uh, finally, somebody didn't show up one night, and he threw me in there. And uh, I started making, I had been making music for a long time in my bedroom before that, but I started recording on a four track cassette recorder in the door while I was working. And, uh, eventually, you know, people started to ask what I was recording and when they were going to be able to hear it. So finally, like I burned some CDs and, um, I figured I'd try to sell them for like five bucks a piece if people were interested in, uh, of what I'd been recording in the door booth, you know, on the job and, um, you know, these songs I'd been doing and, I, I would, you know, didn't know what to call it, but everyone had taken the, instead of calling me a door guy, because I never combed my hair and I had a long beard, people started calling me a door bum because I looked more like a bum, uh, <laughs> like, you know, who's like begging for money at a right. door instead of right. someone who's like charging you admission <laughs> to a show. So, uh, people just started calling me door bum and then, you know, Andy, the door bum. And, uh, at the time, you know, when I put my first record out, I, I realized only people in my town were going to be hearing it. And if I called it that people would know which Andy it was. So, right. right, um, right. And, you know, now all these years later that went from, you know, playing an acoustic guitar at shows to now I, you know, use all these costumes that I make and lights and sort of a weird kind of, kind of psychedelic, uh, dark, strange performance piece. That's theatrical, but, you know, based around all my songs and, um, yeah, it's still called Andy the Doorbum because I, don't, you know, that's just the wagon that I hitched myself to, and cool. Uh, yeah. it'd be it'd be that, silly to change it now because that's what everyone, of course, yeah, branding man. <laughs> if you got an established brand, you got to keep going with that. So yeah, well, you know, at, at least there's not twenty of me when you look it up. You know, that's <laughs> true, right? That's true. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody else is ever going to want that name <laughs> because it doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, man. Awesome, dude. Well, thank you again, man. We really appreciate you yeah. taking your time to, to hang did out. You, did you did you have pleasure. anything? Did you have anything else for us before we? <laughs> you, you know, I I do have a lot of other uh, interesting stories in my life. If you ever want to do this again, I'd love to. Oh uh, yeah, dude. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy yeah. to. I've yeah. uh, been lucky to live uh, a pretty interesting life. You know, I've probably gotten myself into a lot of situations, but um, yeah, you know, I come from it very interesting family and um yeah I, i'm always happy to to share you know Ooh, like what parts of, what make me who i am because i you know that's uh that's why i'm here so. awesome 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 dude yeah well definitely we have a uh open door policy so um just uh we'll uh yeah we'll definitely get back get a hold of you some, again and uh, just have you on and talk again because this that was good yeah. good talk man yeah it's great yeah, I appreciate it. It's, it also feels good, you know, in the midst of a quarantine to talk about my little hermit story because it's yeah. a, little, yeah. a little relevant right now. So yeah. it's, it's nice, to, nice to talk to you all about it. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely, man. Hey, man, did I ever tell you about this recent thing that happened to me? I was driving around in the country, and it was just after dusk. So there's a little bit of light still coming on out of the sky, but it was mostly dark. I saw this black school bus. I don't think I've ever heard this. Okay, so I saw this black school bus. All the windows were tinted, and it started following me for about 15 minutes. Whoa, no. Yeah. What, what did you do? I was at work. I was making deliveries and i just kept making my deliveries and like it would even stop and wait for me oh. and <laughs> yeah, so this, but it was never close enough to where i could see it or anything but it was following me man wow dang that's just an example of another really weird story that happened to me and that could have happened to you you don't have to have a ufo encounter you don't have to have seen the ghost of your grandmother you don't have to know what bigfoot smells like to have had a weird story 
basically what we're saying is weird covers a lot of ground here on the what's your weird story podcast and we love hearing all of your stories whether they're spooky they're funny they're bizarre or they're just short sweet and unexplained kind of like our podcast i've had some weird trips in my life i have i've gone on some trips i don't know that i've ever had one that ended up to be quite what andy had and i don't know how i would have handled it man you mean you've never found yourself scrambling from a ufo slash unknown <laughs> helicopter no. on the side of a canyon wall no. getting stuck through the no. night it covered in nothing but a few pieces of cloth and some mud no <laughs> no but i understand it you know <laughs> oh it's crazy man that is a crazy story man that is a great story and we appreciate you sharing that with us yeah and, uh, uh, check out i don't know if you've watched it yet but um check out his video the movie oh it's did. awesome dude i did and it's great it's more than I expected. I don't know what I was expecting. I guess just a tiny little bit from what he was telling. But, like, it was really good. It's short. It's well done. It's, like, his parts are really psychedelic. Yeah. And he does, like, I, in the episode, you know, in the interview, you heard me talk about how I how I imagined what him looking like. Yep in this and it was spot on yeah i mean man. he looks like that and his everything is is fantastic and then when it gets really psychedelic and he gets really more even less muddy and more mystic yes oh, it's, it's cool it's really cool it's great man it's really good and uh and he's just a, gr- a great guy a great great dude to talk yeah. to you, you know just yeah. a talented guy and uh we yeah we i just you know i I keep uh, I keep saying this, but we just we keep getting great people on. You know, mm-hmm. every, you know mm-hmm. everybody that comes on here. Just you know, it's just fantastic that people come on and, and they're willing to share these stories. And and his is uh, his is one of those that's just uh, it's funny and and I and I and I just can picture that whole thing going down. And you know, in his mind, just thinking how could i conjure this up mm. like what did i do in order to set mm. this thing in motion and uh and not knowing what to do and uh, it's hilarious after the fact i'm sure yeah. it sucked that whole time for him but uh now he's got a, a movie that you can go watch and now you know the backstory of it and it's hilarious yeah. so yeah just a, a great conversation a great story and some awesome music so guys check it out i believe uh you can find him just it's Andy the Doorbum. You can find him uh, all over the internet. Just Google that. And uh, also, we're going to have a track here at the end of the episode. So stick around and check that out. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Yeah. Thanks again, Andy, for coming on, man. We appreciate it. All right. Well, let's wrap this week's episode up in a nice little package. And uh, I'll give you a little bit about next week, Barry. We have uh, we got two friends. Uh, visiting us and uh, they, uh, Aaron and Annie, and uh, they they're good friends and they've known each other for a long time and they've got a story about their trip to uh, to New Orleans and some high strangeness yes that happened there yes and uh, and this was and a lot of fun we had a lot, a lot of, fun. of fun we had a lot of yeah. fun this is a good yeah, interview. Man. Yeah, so they got some cool stories, and it was a lot of fun talking to them. And, you know, just the, the, the chemistry between them as friends. And Aaron is an old friend of mine as well, so we had we had a lot of catching up beforehand that went on before we started recording. So that was a lot of fun. Yeah. But uh, that's going to be a cool, uh, spooky, ooky episode next week. So in the meantime, have a good week. We will see you then. Be safe. Be weird. Here's a song by Andy the Doorbum called Prayer to Ghosts off the album The Fool.
won't you say something? Why won't you die? Why won't you stop breathing? Why won't you take my hand down to the water and throw yourself in? I promise I'd follow. Why won't we die? Why won't we stop breathing? Why won't I cease? All of this death bringing Why won't you, why won't you, why won't you call And why does it matter at all I will creep around I will Touch to warm us. We look for homes to tear apart and burn. And when our sight forsakes the dreams between us, we will go. As always, if you have a weird story, we want to hear it. If you have a lot of them, we want to hear them all. We can't do this podcast without your invaluable contributions. Whether it's sharing your stories, listening, rating, and spreading spreading the the word word about the podcast. podcast. Thanks for listening. Till next time, be safe. Be weird. The stories presented on the What's Your Weird Story podcast are, to our knowledge, true experiences that our guests have had.